spirit of life, that which birthed us and which sustains us. May we feel your presence now in the holy quiet of this hour. May we know that we are not disconnected from that life force which freezes the ponds in winter and calls the plants to grow in the spring. Nurture in us that same resiliency that seeds have. Mary. <laughs> I got it. Sorry. Mary's my spider keeper. <laughs> My folks know I have a little phobia, and the universe is trying to rid me of that by visiting me periodically in the pulpit. <laughs> All part of the same creation, right? Nurture in us that same resiliency that seeds have. All part of the same creation to lie dormant and still for a period before cracking through our hardness, breaking out of our fears, reaching for the light we crave. May we use this healing time not to cocoon ourselves from the world, but to fortify ourselves, brave ourselves, transform ourselves that we may go out into the world as butterflies, also part of the same creation, beautiful and nimble, crossing borders, unlimited by walls, unweighted by the heaviness of that which we fear, that which we do not know. Do not let the vastness of the world be daunting to us, but rather, let our connection to the earth remind us of our connection to each one on it. We are all part of the same creation. We belong to each other. Amen. Our reading this morning is by John Crossley Morgan. I was taking a morning walk down a path outside the Tintern Abbey in Wales when I discovered a rather small but sprawling tree, its branches beckoning to travelers who might rest under its shelter. I crawled under the branches and sat quietly to watch the morning sun break across the ancient abbey sky. It felt safe and even sacred there, a place you might go to rest and reflect on the mystery of life. I sensed the presence of others who had sat in that spot before. Later over lunch, I spoke with a local resident and told him how I had felt sitting under that tree. He looked at me and said quietly, it's called a thin place. I had never heard the name before, so he patiently explained that to the Welsh, a thin place is a very special place, a sacred spot where you feel a presence so deep and mysterious that you have to stretch language to describe it. That sounds like what inspires poetry, I laughed. Maybe that's why the Welsh are such good poets, he said. In the months that followed, I became more aware of thin places in my life, whether in my backyard garden or by a river. I came to understand that once you feel the power of thin places, you tend to experience them often in places you might have missed before. More surprisingly, I learned that when you carry a thin place in your mind and heart, 
You can go there whenever you feel the need. I did not so long ago, before I was wheeled into surgery. Scenes from a Welsh countryside before me, rather than the white gowns of nurses and doctors. Now I carry with me the idea of a thin place, where the veil separating this reality from another is temporarily lifted, so faith and imagination can catch a fleeting glimpse. In Celtic spirituality, there is an idea that heaven and earth are not very far apart. Just three feet, actually. But in some special places, they are closer still. And there, the veil between the two worlds is quite thin. A thin place. Thin places are places of energy, places where you feel the connection not just to the earth, but to eternity, to all that went before and all that will come next. Thin places aren't perceived with the five senses. Experiencing them goes beyond those limits. A thin place pulsates with an energy that connects with our own energy. We feel it, but we do not see it. Mahatma Gandhi in his spiritual message to the world in 1931 speaks of this. There is an indefinable, mysterious power that pervades everything, he said. I feel it, though I do not see it. It is this unseen power that makes itself felt and yet defies all proof because it is so unlike all that I perceive through my senses. It transcends the senses. People have been marking thin places for thousands of years. Ancient people were forever marking spaces as sacred and worth remembering. Now we come upon those sacred markers and feel haunted, as if we too could remember what had happened there if we could just reach through that veil of time. The pre-Christian and Celtic people in Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and England had a keen sense for thin places. The landscape is a treasure trove of markings and ruins proclaiming this, this is holy ground. In a quiet moment, a visitor today can feel the connection with the people whose spirits first marked these spots and all the pilgrims who have visited since. They are vivid reminders that we are all joined inside and outside of time. Mindy Burgoyne, an American who operates a Thin Places tour of Ireland, says, my first experience of a thin place was in Ireland, my first trip there many years ago. I was with some friends driving south into Tipperary. We were doing the typical thing tourists do in Ireland, frequenting pubs, historical sites, finding places to listen to Irish music, frequenting more pubs. Not a spiritually focused group, us. Along the way, she says, the friend who was driving pulled over to look closer at the map. We stopped directly beside the ruins of an old monastery. Curious, I got out of the car. I wandered around the ruins and began to feel strange, almost creepy. I recall there being an old tower with a window. When I looked up at it, I could almost sense the presence of someone there looking out, not looking at me, just looking. Then I began to wonder as I walked, who lived here before? 
who touched these same stones and walked across this field? Who prayed here? What kind of yearnings did they have? Who died here? Why did these monks choose this site in this place to build this monastery? For some reason, Mindy says, the window in the tower continued to draw my attention. My imagination took hold. Without realizing it, I moved into a state of wonder. My friends eventually called out to me asking, how long was I going to keep them waiting? When I returned to the car, they told me I'd been walking in the ruins for a half an hour. I didn't sense that passing of time. I have been back to Ireland many times since, Mindy says. I've never been able to find that monastery again, though I have searched for it on every trip. Oliver Berkman stumbled upon a thin place in Italy. I was in Milan, alone for work, he says, with time to kill, so I bowed to tourist cliché and went to see the Last Supper. The only slot available was early on Sunday, and just after sunrise, the city was deserted. I reached the church of Santa Maria del Grazie as the priest was welcoming the first worshipers. Minutes later, I was escorted with 20 others through security doors to the dim convent hall where Leonardo's painting fills one wall. The early hour added something otherworldly to the atmosphere. None of us seemed fully awake. The silence felt tangible. I'm aware this was a boringly predictable location in which to feel the spine shiver of something beyond words, Oliver says. But I did, and powerfully. I'm no expert, he says, but maybe there's a reason this particular picture of some guys eating some bread is more celebrated than any other. If you're the biblical sort, perhaps... The Garden of Eden was the first thin place. Although the term is most closely associated with the Celtic spirituality of Ireland and Scotland, thin places are not constricted to one religion or religion at all. Eric Weiner, a New York Times writer and author of Man Seeks God, My Flirtations with the Divine, has written extensively about thin places. He found one at the Bangla Sahib Gurdwara, a Sikh temple in New Delhi. The temple owes its thinness, he says, in part to the contrasting thickness amassed outside its gates. The press of humanity, the freestyle traffic, the unrelenting noise, and in general, the controlled anarchy that is urban India. He describes the feeling of entering the temple. We stepped inside the gates of the Gurdwara and into another world. The mesmerizing sound of a harmonium wafted across the reflecting pool. The white marble felt cool on my bare feet. The temple compound was not devoid of people, but this was a different sort of crowd. Everyone walked to the edge of the water, drawn by something unspoken, lost in their solitary worlds together. At the Gurdwara, time bursts its banks, he says. I was awash in time. That's a common reaction to a thin place. It's not that we lose all sense of time, but rather that our relationship with time is altered, softened. In thin places, time is not something we feel compelled to parse or hoard. There's plenty of it to go around. 
Thin places are often sacred places in the more traditional sense, a cathedral, a mosque, a temple, some place others have felt the opening to the eternal and built an altar there. But they can also be a park, a canyon, a set of stones propped up in a circle. But don't count on guidebooks or even friends to pinpoint your thin places. To some extent, Eric says, thinness, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. It can be so disappointing when we don't feel what we are expecting to feel when we are visiting a place others have named as thin or special and sacred. I remember when Lisa and I traveled to Sedona, Arizona, and I heard about vortexes. And I asked, how can you find these sacred places? And people said, you'll just know when you are in one. And so every day as we walked out into that red rock, I sort of walked like this. (laughs) Waiting for that feeling. I never did feel it. I was, of course, awed by the Grand Canyon, but if you'll forgive me, I never did get that sense of a thin place there, although I know others have. But I have experienced thin places in my life. Uh, Star Island is one of them for me. And there are many of them right here in Provincetown, this sacred little spit of land surrounded by the water and the light. The best way to guarantee that you will not find a thin place is to have your heart set on finding one. Better to stumble upon one, find it by accident, be open to it, but not set on it. I say be open to it because though you cannot control when you are going to visit or be visited by a thin place, you do have to have a bit of spiritual imagination. There is a certain degree of openness to the idea required in order to experience it. Now, some people have experienced the feeling who have never even heard of the term thin place, so it's not that you need to have specific knowledge, but just an openness. You know, this past week, during this maddening government shutdown, a tragedy occurred at Joshua Tree National Park in Southern California. The park was closed because there were no park rangers being paid to keep it open. But groups of people cut the chains to enter the closed park and drove their big trucks all over the land, creating new roads where there were none, and even cutting down some of the ancient Joshua trees. A Joshua tree can grow to be a thousand years old. In my opinion, anyone who would cut down a Joshua tree is not going to see a thin place. But they can destroy one. And we can ruin thin places in other ways. Speaking about Jerusalem, Eric Wiener writes, I find the air so thick with animosity so heavy with the weight of historical grievances that any thinness lurking beneath the surface doesn't stand a chance. Thankfully, he says, Rumi's tomb in Turkey has not met such a fate. It is very much alive. People from around the Muslim and non-Muslim world visit the tomb in the central Turkish city of Konya to pay homage to Islam's poet laureate. Rumi's coffin is draped in a green carpet with a cylindrical black hat, the kind worn by dervishes, sitting on top. 
His 13th century poems brim with an ecstatic love of Allah, and his resting place reflects that. People are encouraged to linger. Some curl up in a corner reading Rumi. Others lose themselves in silent prayer. One woman, hand over heart, walked the carpeted floor slowly, tears of joy streaming down her cheeks. Oliver Berkman again. Non-religious people like me seek non-religious explanations for what's going on, and psychologists have tried to help. In her book, The Power of Place, the science writer Winifred Gallagher even suggests that electromagnetic fields generated by certain kinds of rocks might make some locations feel strange. She quotes one neuroscientist speculating that mystical visions at a Coptic church in Cairo might have been related to seismic activity nearby. Maybe, says Oliver. But I'm not sure I want to know what brain scans tell us about thin places or how people respond to psychology questionnaires right after visiting the Grand Canyon. We're in the territory here of the ineffable, the stuff we can't express because it's beyond the power of language to do so. Explanations aren't merely useless, they threaten to get in the way. The experience of a thin place feels special because words fail, leaving stunned silence. So the next time that you are in a place that invokes in you a sense of connection, a sense of mystery, a sense of timelessness, I invite you to do nothing at all. Just linger there a while, enjoying the deep peace of what might be a thin place. Deep peace of the running wave to you deep peace of the floating air to you, deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the shining stars to you, deep peace of the gentle night to you, moon and stars pour their healing light on you, deep peace of the running wave to you, Deep peace of the floating air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace to you. Amen. And blessed be.